Hello, and welcome to Postcards from a Soul and Her Human. I'm the human, Gina. Uh, welcome back to anyone who is returning. I appreciate you very much. And to anyone brand new, welcome. Uh, this is going to be the uh, <laughs> the teaser episode, <laughs> uh, the unintentional teaser episode. So uh, again, that was so funny. Uh, forgive me for that, for getting a little chuckle out of that. Uh, my unintentional teaser in the last uh, two episodes uh, about this particular subject matter that I'm going to speak about today uh, because I gave it enough time to unfold and to uh, to get to a point where I felt comfortable talking about it. And uh, this was quite unusual for me. So uh, I wanted to see it through. And I think I said, like a good experiential physicist, I wanted to do my homework and make sure that I collected all the data needed to, um, to informatively talk about it. Because this was a really unique situation for me. I have had a lot of very unique situations throughout this um, time period of my life, which I will call my awakening. And uh, it's still going on. I don't know that it ever stops. I think that's kind of the point of it. You become, you gain a certain level of awareness first about yourself in your own life and surroundings. And then it starts to just expand outward. And, uh, it, it really is difficult to even think about who I was before this. And, and we're going on three years now. Uh, yeah, I've been writing my book for 32 months, I think. Yeah. So it, this is, this is definitely a process and, um, it's been so interesting and so magical. And I, I, I use the word magical because I can't find another one that, that has the same impact that isn't uh, hyperbolic, uh, but it's not. It really is not at all. It is really the truthful, it's the most truthful way I can put it. it this is magical. I'm, the way I characterize my life now is that I'm living within a fairy tale. <clears throat> and, and, you know, I guess we all are. It's just a matter of, well, whether we recognize it as such, you know, or if you do, you know, look at it as a, a, a haunted, fairy tale instead of a, a magical, you know, fairy tale. I don't know, but, but everything that I'm, the way I live now is so different. It, the awareness is so acute of everything. And, and it's not just of my life and my surroundings, but it's the entire world. And then the entire universe, my awareness of, uh, of, you know, my interest in astronomy really started after this awakening began. And it, it, you know, I've always had an interest in the stars. I've always wanted to live in a place where I could see the Milky Way every night. Um, I, I wanted to move out West. I live in the Midwest. I wanted to move out West to the desert Southwest in order to uh, be able to see, to be near a dark skies community. So I could always go see the stars. And, and, and that, of course, makes absolute sense to me now in this awakened state because I'm from the stars. I'm from a specific star, and and uh, I'm here on a mission, like many of us are. And that longing for that place that I came from is is innate. It's integrated into my ethereal self, and I don't have memories like physical memories of anything, but I do have a draw and a, and a yearning, and it's always been there throughout my life. And the stars have been a very important part of that, the sky. And so I've gotten this interest in astronomy, which which has caused me to look into, <laughs> I mean, just so many things regarding the the whole of our existence, and not just my life and what's in front of my nose. It, it's just quite remarkable how it all expands. So this awareness, uh, you know, it, it, it is acute. It is, it is, uh, unavoidable. And I, I don't know, uh, how you'd perceive this as good or bad, but for me, it just is that I don't miss anything. You know, I talked about serendipity in the last episode, how, how aware I am of the serendipitous events that go on in my life every single day. I mean, I mentioned just a few, it's always, and this is our souls and our soul team 
uh, guidance. This is them urging us or nudging us to go in a direction that is best for us. They always have our best interest at heart. And in my case, and I'm sure many other cases, we're here for a specific purpose. And that purpose, I need guidance as a human being who is mostly dulled to my own ethereal memories. Uh, I need that guidance and that nudging in order for me to take those steps in the physical world to move me towards where I'm meant to go. I've talked about that in many different scenarios in my in my life since I started this podcast and it's it just has become something that I'm just aware of all the time. It it's it's like you know when you when you can't see well and you get a pair of glasses, you know, you 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 don't ever take the glasses off because you you don't see well without them. So I am I have my glasses on and I I can't I don't miss anything anymore. So it's interesting to think about all of that I've gone through as far as impacting my physicality with this emotional or spiritual awakening. And it's funny because all I've ever learned about spiritual awakening or, you know, whatever you want, what term you want to use for it, um, is that you become lighter. You, you raise your frequency and you live this lighter life. And, and, and that really is very difficult to explain and you really have to experience it to understand it, but it doesn't really, it never really impact. It never really talked about the impact on the physical body on how this change or this transmutation affects the physical body. And I have done that because it's been such a profound experience for me to experience the physical elements of this awakening. And I've described many of this. I did a, an episode called Ascension Chaos, which was remarkable. And it's funny, I want to touch back on something from that uh, that might interest you. Uh, if you listen to all of my episodes, this will definitely ring a bell. But uh, during my daughter's, um, when she was giving birth to her daughter, this was last year, she uh, was in the hospital. I was going through this Ascension event is the only way I can put it. Uh, I had just, I, I had a lot of head swimminess. I had a lot of low grade static in my body, but it was manageable. It wasn't anything in, really crazy or anything I would even want to express uh, more than, you know, just an, an average experience with the Ascension. But what happened, and I only I'll, I can only see now as I look back, what happened is I was supposed to go on a trip with my daughter out of state uh, about a month after she gave birth to her daughter. It was a work event for her, and I was going to go and help with the baby, and I had agreed to do that, and uh, I was happy to do that. But once my daughter went into labor and she went into the hospital, I started to experience much more um, disturbing ascension symptoms. And I chalked this up to nervousness about my daughter going into the hospital and no matter whether it was for a, a birth or anything else, it was, it's a stressful time. So, uh, you know, I, I remember feeling very stressed and I, I kept telling myself, she's fine. Don't worry. Everything's fine. And, uh, by the time I was able to go to the hospital to see them because they didn't, they, they wanted to be there by themselves, which I totally understand. It was during COVID. You really weren't allowed anywhere, especially in a hospital, unless you needed to be in there. Uh, it was a very unique and strange time, which I don't feel was an accident at all. I believe that my soul chose the COVID event for my awakening that in order to isolate me to the degree I needed to be isolated to go to do the depth of work that I had to do. So again, serendipity all the hell over the place. It's just no mistakes. And I went to see my daughter after this, you know, she gave birth and, and there were, you know, it's a stressful time for, for anyone, but as the parent of the, of the girl who's giving birth, it was, it's, you know, you know, if you've gone through it, you know what I mean? So by the time I'm able to go to the hospital, I was a little nervous because I was feeling very stressed. And I'm like, I knew that I had been going through Ascension and I wasn't sure what to expect. And I talked about this already. I went to the hospital. I, I you know, put my mask on. I went through there, got to the room. And after about 15, 20 minutes in there, I was sitting on a stool watching the nurse tend to my daughter and the, and the baby. 
and I could feel my body start to seize up or freeze up. It, it was actually heat instead of cold. And I could feel uh, something happening. And I asked my son-in-law for a glass of water, kind of in desperation. I said, could you please get me a glass of water? I didn't know what was happening. Before he could bring me the glass of water, I had already passed out. And the two nurses that were in the room just happened to be right there, which again, no mistakes. And they caught me or whatever, because I was sitting on a stool. I w- when I woke up, I was sitting on the floor by a chair, which was across the room. So I don't have any memory of falling and then getting to that chair. And they, they tended to me very caringly. They you know laid me on my back and put my legs up and asked me all kinds of questions and suggested I go for, uh, you know, to get checked. And I said, no, 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 I'm fine. I understand what's happening. I just, I'm, I'll be fine. And when I left the hospital, I drove myself home, got home is when the real heavy duty, disturbing symptoms started that day. Uh, and, and I talked about this in that, ca- in that episode, Ascension Chaos, how I felt like I might need to go to the doctor or, or the hospital. I was so afraid of what I was feeling, I had this incredible pressure in my rib cage around my, uh, you know, the, where your rib cage is in your body. I, I kept rubbing my hands down my sides because I couldn't relieve the pressure. I felt, uh, this incredible disorientation. I, I was sure that I was dying. <laughs> and I remember my, my ex-husband called me, my first ex-husband, the, the father of my daughter, uh, during that time. And I said to him, I said, you know what, I might need a ride to the doctor, can you please just stand by? I'm not sure what's happening. I was very unsure if I was experiencing ascension, which I had been become very aware of the type of symptoms, or if this was something medical that needed attention. And I uh, Googled really quickly ascension symptoms or, or hospital, something like that, that day. And I, I talked about this in detail, so I won't go on that. I was assured by a message that I received in that result that said, basically, you're not crazy. This is ascension. You're absolutely fine. And then it described some of the symptoms I was experiencing. That was how responsive my higher self or my soul team was in that moment when I needed help. Instead of me feeling the, 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 the uh, compelled to call the doctor or to, to get rushed to the hospital, because that's how disturbing it was, I trusted that message. It immediately calmed me and I knew I was okay. And I went through this few days of absolute chaotic ascension. And when my daughter did finally go, and this was a few weeks later, when my daughter finally went out of state, well, let me back up a little bit. After this happened, me passing out in front of her, we had a conversation when she got home and she said, mom, I'm not really sure you should go. I said, no, absolutely not. I don't want to go. I can't, I don't know what happened for sure. I don't want to put the baby at risk, blah, blah. I didn't go on the trip. And there was another episode I did called fear where I talked about my anxiety getting on an airplane and how, uh, I wasn't sure that was going to work out. And well, I never went on that airplane ride because that was the pl- the, r- the plane ride I was talking about. So I've not been on an airplane since this all started, just, uh, in case anyone's interested that never did play out because I passed out in front of my daughter and she was uncomfortable with me coming, which I totally agreed. I was very relieved that she said that because I didn't want to back out on her because she was relying on me. You know how that goes. So I didn't go on the trip. And now I realize, and the whole reason I'm retelling this is that I was meant to pass out in front of her. It was an isolated incident. It was before the ascension really, the really heavy duty symptoms really started. Um, I was, that meant, that was meant to be, to keep me from going on this trip, which I was not in any shape to go on, but I would have gone out of a sense of duty, not realizing I shouldn't go. So this was my higher self managing my action in the world to make sure I wasn't doing something to put myself in unnecessary discomfort. And of course, my daughter in in absolute discomfort with me. So I, I, I only had that realization last week, looking back that the fact that I fainted in front of my daughter in the hospital room was not a mistake. It was a serendipitous event to make sure I didn't go on that trip. And I told my daughter about it and she said, mom, I totally get it. I, I see that too, because she's been on this journey with me. I've been, uh, you know, we've been integrating with each other and the baby and 
on and on. But my point is, is this manipulation or the serendipity, these uh, events that, I, that I've been going through have all, also been very physical. And that was one example of it. And there's many, many other examples of it. I was you know, I'm retelling some of this, so forgive me. I was driving when I, for a period of time, about a month, when I would get on the freeway and accelerate over 50 miles an hour, my head felt like it was floating, free floating on my body. It was the oddest thing I could, could imagine. It was so disturbing that I did not go on the freeway for a month. And then I finally, t- you know, got the, the nerve up and I went on the freeway and I could see that that had passed. And, and that's one thing I remember all the messages were always don't worry, it'll pass. I always remember getting that message. Don't worry, it'll pass. And, and I would always just remind myself that, and it, and it would. There was another time where I was standing doing my energy exercises. This is way back early in the beginning of my healing, before the seven-month period, which I call you know the, the actual awakening. It took seven months after my ex-husband moved out of my house for me to really get to the point where I realized what was going on wholeheartedly that I had passed, kind of surpassed the difficult parts. And I was now on my way uh, with more full bodied awareness of what was happening to me. And of course it made everything much easier. But I was standing doing my energy exercises one morning and I remember uh, this tornado of energy going through my body. It felt like a a vortex of energy just swirling in my torso from my pelvis all the way up to my neck, mostly concentrated in my upper, ch- uh, lower chest or my solar plexus and in my, in my chest or my heart area. Just this incredible, powerful, energetic burst or, tor- or tornado in my body. And I remember standing there in awe, like shocked. And I wrote all about this. It's all in my book. I detailed every one of these events. And then an, an another time I was driving from a meeting where I was actually buying my house from my ex-husband. I was driving home from the bank where I'd signed the papers. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, that's not true. Erase that. I was driving home from the bank, but it wasn't, it wasn't the loan. It was, I opened a new account. So forgive me, that's not true. On my way back from this bank, I uh, was driving and I felt like, I don't know if how it, I guess maybe this is what it would feels would feel like if you had too much caffeine, just this kind of like hyper, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It was so powerful. I almost pulled off the road. And I just remember saying to myself, gripping the wheel, like, like it was, uh, you know, a branch over, (laughs) over the Grand Canyon, uh, that this is going to pass. You're fine. It's going to pass. It's going to pass. And I slowed way down. I almost pulled off, but I just slowed down. And by the time I got home, it had passed completely. And I just remember sitting at my, on my couch thinking, what the fuck was that? Just such awe-inspiring, energetic events. And there, and, and there are more. There, I was sitting on my couch watching a show. Actually, it was Outlander, which I was very much in tune to at that time. So much so that I thought my, my twin flame was going to be from Scotland. <laughs> But that was not the case. I was given messages after that, that no, it's not Scotland, it's New Zealand. So anyway, I was sitting watching just a quiet evening by myself during those, again, these first months, first seven months or so of this uh, awakening. And I felt what I can only describe as a pulse of energy come from the back of my head and shoot out of the front of my face. I guess your face is in the front. That's redundant, but shoot out of my face. It was like a, like a ball of energy just built up from the back of my head, or it was actually slammed into the back of my head and moved through the sides of my head into my face and out of my face. And, and I described it as a pulsar, a pulse of energy. It was so powerful. I mean, this is what happened to me during this ascension period, during this transmutation. And this is exactly what it was or is. It's a transmutation of energy. It's changing the dynamic, the structure of the cells in my body, the molecularly. It is amazing what is happening. And I would not believe any of this if you were telling me this story, but I experienced it and I detailed all of it in, a, in the book that I'm writing. And I've talked about it extensively. So all of these energetic events, I mean, these are just a few of them. They were constant. I was always on notice that wherever I am or whatever I'm doing, I may experience something completely odd and, and, and disruptive. And I just kind of learned to, you know, uh, 
to, to allow it to be and to know that it would pass. And it always has. So this gift that I've been receiving of this ascension, I always tell myself, make me as uncomfortable as you need to. Cancel trips, do whatever you need to do. I'm getting this incredible gift of this ascension, this expansion. So yeah, I'll, I'll pay that price. It's no big deal. And I still say that to today because I still have very low grade um, symptoms, which, you know, they kind of present as anxiety. So I, you know, I wanted to say there for anybody out there who maybe feels that low grade static in their body, you know, pay attention to how else you feel and what else you're going through and the serendipity going on around you. You may be going through ascension, which we all are to some degree. And maybe it doesn't need to be medicated and maybe it doesn't, it's not emotional. Maybe it is physiological. Um, just to put that out there. Uh, I mean, we're so quick to medicate ourselves. If there is an issue that we don't want to, that we're not, that we don't know how to deal with. Um, once you medicate your, the game's over because you can no longer gauge your body's natural response to what's happening. So if I would have taken antidepressants or I would have taken, even cold medicine, I don't know, I would have masked the symptoms, which would have masked my body's response and wouldn't have allowed me to really understand what was happening. It would have kept me in a place of fear. So I just want to say that out loud too, in case that is meaningful to anyone. But what happened to me recently, what started about a month and a week ago, it was actually January 11th of 2024. This was the first day this started. Uh, and, and this, this is so, and I, I want to tell the story, uh, in a certain way, because I want you to understand the, uh, the context is that this, the energy in my body has played a, uh, crucial role physiologically in me getting where I need to go. I explained the whole situation where I, um, was looking for a job and my body, my energy just shut down and I didn't, I stopped looking for the job. I woke up the next morning and realized, okay, I'm not meant to go in that direction anymore. How amazing is that, that I was able to screech to a halt, something that I thought for sure I needed to do because my energy said, no, you're good. You don't need to do that. We're going to shut you down. We need you to understand what's happening. You know, you're no longer, you don't need to find a job. That was, that was what happened. So that was my body's energy draining. It was a physiological response or, or not response, physiological message for me to adhere to what my uh, intuition by the next morning was telling me. And I always sleep on it. It is so crucial for me anyway. If I have an idea, sleep on it, because if it's still there in the morning or if it's formed any more fully, it is the truth. And it doesn't have to come from any resource that I can validate. This is how powerful the connection is to my higher self and to the ethereal realm where I exist as a being always. I'm just a dimensional uh, copy of myself here having this experience. I am a multidimensional being, so I'm not just here. I'm everywhere. And I'm having experiences, and, I'm, and this is who I am ethereally, who we are ethereally. So, you know, I, I have to remember that. It's not just my human brain being acute and sharp and, and aware. It is my ethereal body, my blue body, my light body is where all the wisdom comes from. So if I'm only listening to my brain, then I'm missing out on, uh, on everything my soul's here to do. And this is just another, another example of this experiential work that I'm doing to bring to light how powerful and definite and um, what a privilege it is for us to have this onboard navigation. It, it literally is take your hands off the wheel and let the car drive itself. When we get to the point where we finally trust ourselves enough. And of course, when you start to trust yourself, everything starts to emerge in your life as uh, from that trust. I no longer have to struggle. I no longer have to have concern. I no longer have to worry that it just is not a thing anymore. 
this channel is so open and the, and the energy is flowing so freely. It is just like on autopilot. And I can focus my brain on the cosmos, on world peace, on, I'm sorry, world peace is too small, on cosmic peace. You know, and, and my interests go upward and outward. I, I, I don't even know how to describe that any better without sounding condescending. That's not how I mean it at all. My human life is extremely important. I came into this body to have this incredible experience, to learn and to grow. This is how I evolve by learning and growing and experiencing everything I'm experiencing. And I set up a, a lot of crazy, difficult experiences for myself so I could evolve to, or transcend them after integrating them and then become this, uh, this all seeing being. I mean, this is what the third eye is for. And I didn't understand this when I first heard this, that I had a very, powerful third eye. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. And again, I didn't study this. I didn't study spiritualism. I didn't, I didn't want to, I didn't know enough to want to be spiritual. I just wanted to be free of my lower self. So my, so my third eye or our third eye, which is, is a mechanism for us to witness ourselves having our life's experience. So, so the simple way to put that is our third eye is our perspective. If I, if my perspective is broad enough and ascended enough to see my whole human life as a, a matrix and a, a virtual reality experience, that is the ascension, that ascension above or transcendence of our lower vibrational selves is the third eye seeing everything as it is without fear, without judgment, and with complete compassion. And once that third eye activates for your own life, it just naturally expands to all humanity. And this is where unconditional love comes from. So the third eye, and it's funny, I read, I get messages through my social media. I don't post personally on social media. I only post my podcast episodes and my articles. Uh, I'm on several platforms. I don't post anything personal. I really don't follow anyone or I don't, not connected to friends on, on those platforms. I just, I don't post personally. So I don't want to be a voyeur in your life and only look at what you're doing and not post. So I just kind of stay off of it completely. Uh, but I do get messages, and I talked about this before, that are suggested or recommended messages for you. And, and lately they have been so beautiful. And they're all about being with a partner in this world. And a lot of them are leaning towards or about twin flames or soulmates, which of course this makes sense because this is still in my future, although it's already in my body. I've been getting communication from this twin flame energetically for almost three years now. And this connection is powerful and it's, uh, it's part of my being in my body and the, and the messages that I'm getting now, and they're always relevant to what I'm going through. There always are validations or like, if I have a question, it'll be answered in a, in a random message. But one of the messages I saw recently was about how Amazing it is that you erased all of your memory, all your ethereal memory, and then you still found your way back to source. I mean, that to me was really powerful and it really explains what we're doing here. And it was a congratulatory message from my soul team that, hey, look what you've done. You've erased your memory of the fact that you are this goddess, this ethereal being who is not encapsulated in any body or restricted in any atmosphere. And that you came into this human suit to have this, this uh, sedentary, not sedentary, this solitary experience where you feel alone and lost and, and you chose this so you can have these experiences and learn and you got and you found your way back to your, to your remembering. I mean, that is amazing. <laughs> it really is. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically, you know, getting your eyes covered and being told to walk through a labyrinth and then get and let me know when you come out the other side. That's basically what we do here as humans uh, to have this experience in order for us to evolve. So 
the messages are very powerful. They come constantly. I won't get too far into that. That maybe is another episode, but, uh, but I'm always being validated on what I'm doing and what I'm going through and how I'm responding to it. It is all part of this guidance and this, um, connection or this open channel to our ethereal selves. And of course that channel, oh, I can go on about it. And I won't, there's so much I want to tell you, but I, I want to keep things in context. So what happened, this event that I went through recently about, it started a month and a week ago. It was uh, um, a Wednesday night. I had spent the, f- the f- few days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday with my daughter and her daughter, my grandbaby. And it was a very concentrated period of time. She was getting ready for event, an event in February, which she had to go out of town again for the same one as the year before. And I was um, helping out, spending a lot of time with them. And this was a Wednesday evening and I was at home and I, and I realized that I didn't feel well. And I, and I was like, what is going on? Why do I feel like, like, like weird about it? Like I realized that I was starting to get emotional and I was thinking to myself, what is going on here? Why do I feel emotional? And I started to feel this terrible, terrible feeling like I had done something wrong. And I realized what was happening is I was worried that maybe because I didn't feel well that I had gotten my daughter and maybe my grandbaby sick. And I didn't realize it because I didn't feel well then and I don't feel well now, but I was with them all day. And I started to have this really irrational uh, um, reaction or response to not feeling well. And, I, and, and it was not even anything big. I just was sitting there thinking, oh, I don't really feel well. And then I, you know, again, I... I always think it's the ascension. And then I, but that, that thought did not enter my mind. I went directly to, oh my gosh, I'm sick. I must've gotten the girl sick. Oh my God. How, what am I going to do? I had this incredibly irrational response to just not feeling well and realizing I'd spent three days with the girls. And I realized something was happening. I said to myself out loud, I was watching TV. I turned off the TV. I said, okay, what is going on? Why am I having this irrational response to not feeling well? Something else is happening. And I become so acutely aware, again, aware of everything, that when something happens to me that is out of the ordinary to pay very close attention, to not push it away, to not wish it away or ignore it, to give it the time and space that it needs to move through me. This is what I've learned. I did a a podcast episode called The Emotional Baggage Handler, where I talked about this physical process that happens to me, where I purge emotional energy out of my body, or I refer to them as thorns or demons, however you want to look at it. And I'm sitting on the couch and and I'm having this, uh, it's just a rational response. And I started to cry. Um, And I'm saying to myself, laughing, why are you crying? What is going on? And I remember that when I was going through my dark night of the soul, when I was having the most disturbing thoughts and feelings and emotional reactions, I would talk to myself as a friend and I still do it. I said, Gina, whatever this is, we're going to get through together. Just take a deep breath. Let's see where it takes us. And I started to cry. And then I started to sob. I was sobbing like uncontrollably and I'm laughing because I know whatever's happening is not in relation to, or in balance with what, with what little feeling I had that maybe I was sick and maybe I got my girl sick. And I was just in awe of what was happening. I was having this incredibly traumatic experience over this thought that maybe I got my girl sick. And I'm sitting on the couch laughing and crying, sobbing uncontrollably. I don't know how long much time went by, 45 minutes maybe. And I'm sitting there finally calmed down. And I just could not shake this feeling of like, I did something wrong and oh my God, what did I do? And how do I fix it? Oh my gosh, it was terrible. I finally went to bed. I thought, okay, just go to sleep. You'll feel better in the morning, whatever it is. So I went to sleep that Wednesday night and I woke up in the morning. And as soon as I opened my eyes, this feeling of dread just overcame me. And I mean dread, if you've ever felt dread, and this is one of the symptoms of ascension is a feeling of dread when there's no proper place to put it. But I I felt this incredible dread and I thought, oh my God, how am I going to overcome this? How am I going to move on from this? I felt so desperately, uh, 
like I, like I need to go to jail. Like I did something so horrible and I, how am I ever going to overcome this? And I sat on the edge of my bed just in this absolute desperation and this feeling of absolute dread when I had a realization. And I said, holy shit out loud. And I, and I'm still feeling just dread and I'm thinking, oh my God, I know what this is. I know what this is. And I said it just like that. I know what this is. And what had happened was, and I have to go back to tell you this story is during COVID-19 back in 2020, early 2020. And just for some context, 2020 was the year I broke up with my ex-husband and I got my divorce. 2020 was the most traumatic year, I would say, of my life to date. I was uh, distraught. I was confused. I felt abandoned and alone. I didn't know what what was going to happen to me, if I was going to leave my business, if I was going to end up losing my home, my vehicle. I was just in a state of absolute chaos. And anyone who's gone through a major breakup knows what I'm talking about. It's nothing unusual. But on top of it was COVID-19. We had shut down our auction hall after our very first auction in 2020. And we had only been open a year and we had the best year we've ever had as a company. When we had our, our we had a monthly in-person auction and um, that was what the work that I did. I sold all the inventory that we brought in and we were in a state liquidation company and an auction company. My ex-husband was an auctioneer. So he would run the auctions. I would run the, the console and set everything up. And we had these wonderful monthly auctions where we did really well. And we had a, one full year of auctions and then we had to shut down because of COVID. And that's when I hired, I think I misspoke in my last episode, we had stopped doing in-person auctions. I had to put everything that we sold online now, which was a huge job. So instead of laying everything on tables, not pricing anything and just letting people bid on everything, now I had to research every single item, photograph it, describe it, and put a price or a value ratio on it in order for people to bid for it online. So this changed my monthly auction work into a two-person job, which is when I hired the young lady who came in to help me. And then during that time, and and remember, I broke up with my ex-husband in July of that, of 2020. That's the month I hired this young lady who was the one who serendipitously introduced me to all the material, including the tarot readers that were my main source of guidance through this awakening. And I, and for a year and a half, until I stopped looking at the readings as a signal to my soul team that I was ready to go on my own, which has been over a year now. So just see how critical this time period was for me. So during this time, when we shut down the auction hall and I had to hire help and, and we wore masks and I was so worried during this time of, of stress and, and, uh, incredible heartbreak that I was going through, I still had to run this business and I was so afraid of this virus because people were dying on mass. And it was just, I was watching the news every single night. And I had been at 9 PM. I watched this certain channel and I would watch for an hour or two, even of news at night about the devastation of this uh, virus and how it was sweeping through the world. And all these people were dying. And I was just in the middle of this incredible trauma. And it just came into my body as an infection or a phobia the fear of germs. And I had never, I've always been aware of germs. I would call myself germ aware. Like I wasn't one to to grab a public door handle. And I, when I would go into a restaurant to eat dinner, I would ask for a lemon slice and I would just wipe my hands with a lemon slice, or I'd wipe the edge of my glass, my water glass with a lemon. Because to me, that was kind of like my way of cleaning up you know, a little bit before I ate, I, you know, that was what I always did. So door handles, keep that in mind, door handles and lemon is what I did pre COVID. But beyond that, I never thought about germs. I didn't worry about my cell phone or touching anything and blah, blah, blah. But during COVID, it was very clear that we were supposed to beyond getting the, the, um, the shots, we were supposed to wipe off everything that we brought in our houses and wash our hands and don't touch our faces and all that stuff. And this was all going on 
at the height of the trauma I was going through with my ex-husband and leaving him and all of that I that I've detailed over and over in many different episodes and articles and everything that I'm doing. Uh, it was a very traumatic time. So I refer to this phobia of germs as coming into my body during that window and infecting me or embedding in my energy. So what I mean is, is I followed all the, the COVID protocols during COVID. Now at this time, it was six months. Well, it was a full year later before my ex-husband moved out. But during this time period, I was very stringent at home. I wouldn't let him come in the house unless he washed his hands first. I, I was very careful with everything. And it was just really kind of normal, careful. Fast forward a year later when my ex-husband finally leaves my house, which was tw- now June of 2021, a year and a half later, not quite, a year and three months or so, when, when I finally go through the trauma of going to the hospital and, and going through the breathlessness and then starting to realize you know, that I was connected to the soul team and all that started to happen, I, um, and during, it was during that time where I got this material from the young lady who worked with me. It wasn't right when she started. It was very appropriately when I was ready to start to utilize it. But during all that time, after my ex-husband left and I went through that period of recovery, the the COVID protocols became uh, malignant. And, And I'm sure there are people out there who will be able to relate to this. I would not bring anything into my house. Uh, without putting it on a certain area in my kitchen where it would sit there for either two to two days to a week, depending on whether I need it or not. Or if I touched it between that time period, I washed my hands. So making dinner was ridiculous. If I touched something that I brought in in less than a week ago, it was a couple of days to a week, depending on how I was feeling. I would work with it, put it away and then wash my hands. So to make a sandwich took me 20 minutes because I would touch the bread, put the bread on the plate. I would fold up the bread. Then I would get whatever else I could touch with my hands dirty, quote unquote. And then once that was done, I would wash my hands and then do the next step and then wash my hands again. And then I had to wash my hands before I ate. And and this is how I dealt with every single meal. If I brought in takeout, which I did, uh, at that, during that time, I would put it on a plate and discard the, the, um, container and wash my hands before I ate. I wouldn't touch my remote controls. I wouldn't touch anything in the house unless I'd wash my hands. And I also, which was the biggest thing, would not bring my phone in the house unless I sanitized it with a wipe when I had a stack of them right at my, near my front door. So my phone did not come inside my house unless it was sanitized and everything that came into my house, I either washed my hands or had it had to sit there for up to a week before I would touch it again. On top of this, you have to remember during COVID, I was completely isolated. No one was in my home for over a year. And finally, there came a time where my daughter would come over on occasion, but this was before she had her baby. We didn't have a lot of, uh, I didn't see her a lot. She had her own life. I had mine. It wasn't really unusual at all. I would see her when I, she would come to the auction hall and visit. I would see her, but she, no, nobody really came to my home that much. But when, when somebody would come, including my daughter, and I told her this, if she would touch something in my house after she would leave, I would sanitize everything. The door handle, the handles on my cabinets, the handles on my refrigerator, my bathroom, everything, almost in, frantically. It had become such a malignant uh, part of my energy. Uh, and and I, again, I, to anyone who has any kind of phobia, I, I totally feel for you because this was absolutely controlling my life. I could not do anything without first thinking of what, how am I going to fix it if, if I touch it? For example, I would go to a restaurant and I did this once a week for a long time with my sister-in-laws. Well, I'll, I'll always refer to them as my sister-in-laws, although they are my first husband's sisters. Uh, we go to dinner once a week, my sister. And when I would go into the restaurant after I hand, I wouldn't touch the door handle at all. Somebody else would open the door or I would use a tissue And then once I handled the menu, the chair, the table, my phone, and put everything down right before the food came, I would get up and go wash my hands. And I would come back to the, to the table, like a surgeon, like I'm not touching anything (laughs) still. And then when I got my silverware with the lemon, I would just ridiculous. Okay. With the lemon, I would just wipe the silverware at this point. I did not drink 
and have not, this is something that changed during my transmutation is I don't drink a beverage when I eat ever. So when I go into a restaurant, I don't order anything to drink unless I need the lemon and then I'll order water with lemon or just lemon. But if I order just lemon, the waitress or waiter looks at me like I'm crazy. Like, why do you want a lemon? You're not getting water. So sometimes I'll order water with lemon and that way I have a good reason to have the lemon and I wipe off the fork or whatever with the lemon. So that's what, that was what I did every time I would go to eat. That's what I did every time I brought something home. I was, I wouldn't touch anything publicly without sanitizing my hands before I came in my house. I have a bottle of sanitizer in my truck, which I know a lot of us did during this time, that every time I went into the grocery store and I would come back in or when I touched anything outside of my truck, I would sanitize my hands before I dry, drove off. And then when I go home, wash my hands first, put away the groceries, sanitize my phone, and don't touch anything unless you, <laughs> that if you touch anything, wash your hands again. This was my life. And during a lot of this time, I lived alone. It didn't really, I didn't really notice it. But then my daughter has her, her child. They're, you know, they're in my home. I'm inviting them over and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, are you going to be able to handle this? And, and now my daughter's spending time with the grandbaby and I'm just starting to learn from my daughter. She comes in my house and she throws her stuff down. She eats without washing her hands. She's doing all these normal things. And I'm, I'm paying very close attention. I'm realizing, okay, Gina, just watch her learn how to live in the world again. And I would watch her and, and I would get relaxed. I would stop sanitizing things after she left. I got much, much better because I was now intending on doing that. But I realized I still had this in my body and it still controlled me. And one of the things that I, one of the affirmations that I still do every other day when I do my energy work, there's just three things that I ask for. And I've done this for a very long time. And they're all, to me, they're all encompassing uh, you can call them wishes, but to me, they're just kind of statements of my intention and how to live in this world. And the first one is true love. I want to experience true love. That's something that I believe is coming to me. I really honestly am already experiencing it. And I think this is part of the reason why I was so directly introduced to my twin flame. I was, he came through to my daughter. She had a conversation with him, she knew his name. She had his website. She showed me his picture. I know who this person is. And I'm like, why do I know who he is? Long story short, this, this integration of our hearts is, is my awareness of him is part of that, is me knowing that he's out in the world and, and not losing faith and having the energetic frequency that I needed to maintain. I needed to understand and have faith that love was out there in order for my frequency to be at the level it needed to be to balance out my world, my chakras, to allow this ethereal being of who I am to come through this body. I could not be heartbroken because the way I felt about love after my ex-husband, and, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, is I was done. I no longer cared about a man in my life. And I said, if I ever have a relationship again, I remember telling my daughter this, it'll be emotional only. I'm not physically getting involved with anyone. I've had very traumatic relation, uh, experiences sexually with men, and I was not interested anymore. After what had happened with my ex-husband, I was not interested anymore. I said, I'm, that sh we're just shutting down shop. And that's what, how I felt. And actually, there's a part of my book that I wrote about that early on that I think I'll probably leave in there because it's a snapshot of who I was then. I just said, I get it. Not meant for me. I'm happy. We're closing down shop. Maybe I'll have a friendship or a, an emotional relationship with somebody, maybe several somebodies, I said. Um, so that's who I would have been if I didn't know any better. And I think my soul team, my higher self just said, you know what, show her so she knows she can have faith. It's part of the faith that she's building in this world so she can raise her vibration to the level it needs to be for, we, for us to do this work for us to have this third eye activation, there cannot be anything blocking it. And that energetic thorn in my body would have been a barrier to that channel being open. So looking back, I believe that's why I know who he is. So I can connect with him more than just thoughtfully or more than just with faith or belief, quote unquote. Because like I said, I don't believe anything anymore. I just know. So 
True love is one of the things that I exclaim every other day when I do my energy exercises. And the other thing is highest purpose because my soul is here on a mission. I'm here to complete a mission as a star seed, as a light worker, as a uh, avatar, whatever you want to refer to yourself as, or it doesn't matter. I'm here to do a job and that job is, is why I'm here. So. I want to be conditioned or reconditioned and transmuted or transcended from who I was in order to, to complete that mission. It's very important to me as a human to do what my soul came here to do. I'm completely engaged. You know, and I know I'm going to have to move away someday. I'm going to move across the world. It's part of this journey. And, I, and my sister said to me, and I don't think she'd mind me saying this, she said, how could you go with, you know, leave your family, you know, your grandbaby and your daughter. And I just looked at her. I said, because it's my soul's work. It's why my soul's here. And the reason my soul is here is so much bigger than my human life. And my daughter knows this. And my granddaughter has a similar mission there. They also have the same understanding that we're not just here to have a human life. We're here as ethereal beings. So because I see so far beyond all of that, of course, I don't want to leave. It's going to be the, it's been described as one of the most difficult things I'll ever do is to leave my babies, but it's part of my soul's mission here to do that. And so I'm going to do that. There's just no way around it. I'm not going to wish for it to happen. I'm not going to make it happen. I'm going to wait for it to emerge in my life. And when it does, it does. And that'll be that. And my daughter's very much aware of that. So Highest purpose is the second thing I exclaim. And the third thing is absolute freedom. So if I want absolute freedom, first of all, I'm accountable for who I am, for how I design my life, how I co-create my environment, my world, who I am in this world and who I allow into my life and how I manage them and treat them and how I manage how they treat me. You have to be a hundred percent accountable to be absolutely free. And, 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 you know, we all wish for freedom and we want love. We want all these things. And we don't realize that we have to be fortified to, to carry these things in the world. I don't want absolute freedom if I'm not an accountable person, because I need you to, uh, to define me. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not free. If you define me, I'm just who you need me to be. And I, I become, a uh, uh, um, a version of myself for you. And of course I did that in all my relationships. Most women do and men I'm sure too. But without this, a 100% accountability, you cannot experience freedom. It's just, they're two opposing things. They exist on different frequencies, just like love and hate, two different frequencies, two different polarities. So absolute freedom is one of the things that I exclaim into the world. That's how I want to live my life. That is how I choose to live. How can I be free if I'm controlled by a phobia? And I knew this and I would have these, you know, these conversations with myself, not like in the, in, in, not from an aware perspective though. I just knew it was in my body swirling around. And one of these days I'm going to have to pluck it like a thorn. So this, so that's the context that I need you to understand. So for two and a half years, that was 2021, I'm sorry, 2020, three and a half years for three and a half years, I've been behaving as if COVID was still raging. And, and I'm not just talking COVID protocol. I'm talking malignant proto, uh, protocol because I had gone so overboard. Uh, even way more than I did during COVID because during the first part year of it, I was still living with my ex-husband. So I couldn't control him. I didn't feel the same way that I did after he left. Once he left is when it really started to infect me. When this thorn really dug deep into my body, when this demon really got a hold of me. And I knew it was happening, but I couldn't do anything about it. My logical mind would say, what are you doing? I would be washing my hands for the umpteenth time. And I would say myself out loud, what are you doing? But I could not help myself. And this is what a phobia is. It is an unreasonable fear. I was no longer afraid of getting sick. I knew from my soul team that I was protected that yes, maybe I can get sick, but I'm not going to die from an illness unless that's what my soul 
chose. And because I knew my soul had this mission, that wasn't going to happen. My fear of being sick was gone. It had been for a couple of years. So why do I still feel this phobic need to sanitize and wash constantly? It was completely irrational and I knew it was, but I could not beat it. Not with my brain. So I would try to make strides. And like I said, when my daughter would come over, which was more and more frequently, I got way more comfortable because now she was making lunch and not washing her hands and I was eating it and I felt fine. I was, when I would make lunch with her there, I would have to like fight myself not to do all the hand washings because I knew they were not needed. I just watched her do it. I can do it too. And I was like, come on, G, you can do it. And it took so much effort though to do it, but I would do it. And then I'm, I knew that I had so much longer to go. I had so much farther to go. When somebody would come in my home and drop their coat on my table, once they left and their coat left, I would sanitize that table. This is how drastic this got, how dramatically malignant this got in my life. Nobody really knows this. I mean, my daughter knows this. My sister, I think, knows it. But I really haven't talked about it to anyone else because this is a private struggle. I mean, we have our private struggles. And I, I don't mind talking about anything. I, I'm, I'm here to talk about my life. I don't care how intimate or personal. It doesn't matter. But this was something inside of me that I didn't know how to address. So I'm learning from my daughter. I'm letting go of what I could. And I'm getting way more comfortable when I go to her house. As a courtesy, and I will continue to do this, I wash my hands before I touch that baby. I just think that's a courtesy. Whether it isn't or not, I'm not shooting for perfection here. I just want to do what makes sense where I'm not controlled by something that does not make any sense. So, uh, you know, uh, what had happened was when I was sitting on my couch that Wednesday night, January 11th, and I started to have this fear of my illness infecting my girls, I was brought to a place that is very familiar by my higher self. I was brought to the arena of uh, where we cure things. I was brought to a place in my psyche, in my emotionality, where I can finally purge this. And I didn't know this the night before, but when I woke up in the morning, that Thursday morning, and I sat on the edge of my bed in that absolute dread, where I'm thinking, how am I going to overcome this? If you ever felt dread, it is all encompassing. You cannot see beyond it. As much as I knew about myself and what I, the temporary things that I'm going through and, and don't worry, it'll pass. I couldn't touch. I couldn't reach any of that in that moment. I was in, it was just in absolutely enveloped in this feeling of dread. And of course that dread was there for a purpose. It drew out the true root of this issue, which was my phobia. And, and I sat on the edge of the bed and I said out loud, I know what this is. This is my germ phobia. That's what this is. And I sat there in awe of myself for realizing in that moment that this had nothing to do with my girls. It had nothing to do with me feeling sick the night before, which by the way, I didn't feel sick anymore. And I sat there and I just knew. And as soon as I had this realization, and this is the physiological part that I want you to pay attention to. As soon I'm sitting on the edge of my bed, as soon as I had the realization that this was about my phobia of germs, and, and, and just again, to, to punctuate this a little more, I would not bring my cell phone anywhere near my bedroom or my bathroom if I wasn't, it didn't clean it, especially my bedroom. So, okay. So I'm sitting there and I had this realization. And as soon as I had the realization, I could feel heat start in my body. Now I, I explained heat events before I've had several of them. One uh, was during that Ascension event where I did the Ascension chaos, where the heat was so, so powerful. I felt it coming off of my eyeballs. Heat obviously is a mechanism in the body, like a fever to expel toxins. And I believe that's exactly what this is doing. This heat started to rise so dramatically in my body that I jumped off the bed and I walked to the edge of my bed and I was standing there stiff as a board, just wondering what is going to happen next. And this heat came up from my body. I would say it started around my thighs, which is weird. That's where heat starts when I have these heat events in the, the tops of the fronts of my thighs. I could feel the heat start there and it started to climb up my body 
like so imagine you're watching uh the sunset over a tree and you can see the the uh shadow coming up the tree and the sun disappearing above and then then the tree is completely in the shadow that's how if you picture that that's what it felt like like this heat was just coming up and just enveloping my whole body it was getting more and more intense all the way up my body up my torso up and i would characterize it as up the sides of my rib cage and then before it reached my shoulders it shot out of my body like a rocket and i was standing in my bedroom just like with my mouth agape going what the frig was that it was this amazing experience with heat. It just rose off my body. It just grabbed my whole body. And then it just shot off my body like a rocket. And, and as soon as that heat left my body, and it was not a gentle thing, it was a very powerful, uh, disruptive feeling. It shot off of my body. And as soon as it shot off my body, I felt a nausea overcome me. So much so that I ran to the bathroom by the, near the toilet in case I had to vomit. I'm like, okay. I was just saying out loud, what the hell? I was kind of giggling because I knew this was something important. I've been through this before. And I walked back into my bedroom after literally a full minute of standing there, like with my mouth open. And I, and I knew what this was. I knew that was a physical expellation, a purging of this burden of this thorn of this demon out of my body, of this phobia of germs. I knew that's what it was. And I just stood there in absolute awe thinking, oh my God. And all I could say was, I hear you. Thank you. That's all I could say. Because I knew that that's what that was. That was that phobia purging out of my body. That was my body saying, we're done with this. It doesn't serve your freedom. It's not going to serve you going forward. It's time to let it go. So after that happened, of course, I'm walking around a little bit uh, like a zombie because I, what I just experienced, and it was so powerful. And I knew that, I had, that it was time for me to stop doing all the things I was doing externally to satisfy this demon's hunger for fear and phobia to control me. And that's what it is. So the demon got purged, and, I'm, I, and I said out loud, thank you. I got it from here. And I knew that it was time for me to change my habits. And I knew it wasn't going to be overnight. I knew this. So, <laughs> so that was Wednesday, Thursday morning. By Friday, when I woke up the Friday morning, my mind was negotiating with my soul. And the negotiation was basically, but it still makes sense to clean your phone, right? It still makes sense to clean your hands after the grocery store, right? That just makes sense. I mean, come on, we're not going to be stupid here, right? And I, rem and I could feel that the conversation going back and forth. And I said out loud, I said, Gina, help me out here. Help me out here, please. If I'm going to let go of this phobia, I have to let it go. I can't just, I can't satisfy parts of it that seem to make sense to my tortured mind uh, and then allow this to remain in my body in any way, shape or form. So I went on with my day. That was Friday and that all day long the back and forth, just, you're going to have to clean your phone. And to mind you, I'm at home. I haven't gone anywhere. <sighs> oh my God, it's so funny. So the next day was a Saturday and I had still not gone anywhere. I hadn't seen my daughter. She was busy with her life. I didn't see her those couple of days, which again is by design. It's so funny how when I spend time with my daughters and then she says, mom, you don't need to come over tomorrow. We're doing this or this or that is a day where something like this will happen. Or I need to sleep half a day because I'm exhausted. It's, it's very, very well balanced when I get my rest time and when I spend time with the girls. And it's very, I think they're both very important. My rest is still so important. So my body knows to give me breaks and that's what it, it happens naturally. So this next morning was Saturday and I have to go, uh, where am I going on Saturday? I was in the car. I don't know where I was going. I'm driving. Maybe I just went to take a drive. Maybe that's what I did because this negotiation is still going back and forth and I have no resolution and I'm driving and I'm thinking, and I, you know, I'm just kind of lost in this thought as I'm driving and I'm like, well, let me turn on the radio just to get it, you know, just to distract me from this, with this kind of this negotiation going on in my brain, in my body. And I turned on the radio. And as soon as I turned it on, I realized, no, I don't want to listen to the radio. 
So I turned it on. And if you turn on the radio with a dial, you know that it, it, it kind of, the, the sound kind of emerges. And then when you turn it off, the sound kind of demerges or what if that's the right word, it takes a second for it to go away completely. So while it, when I turned the radio on and then before I can turn it off, which literally was a second, I heard the phrase in a song, let it go. And this is just the miraculous part of all of this guidance and this validation is I knew if I didn't let it all go, that parts of it were going to remain and control me. I knew that. And anyone who has an addiction or a phobia knows this. If you're an alcoholic, you can't just have a drink at five o'clock because the drink turns into two and well, I'll just have one tomorrow. And then you have three and you know what I'm saying? You can't, you can't, you're not fortified enough to control it. Whether you, if you have a, um, uh, you know, if you, if you get, if, if you are subject to addiction, which I never have been in my life, I smoked when I was a kid, my mom smoked, I stole her cigarettes. I think it was eight years old when I had my first cigarette, I smoked till I was 19. And when I realized that it was bad for me and I shouldn't do it anymore. And I just stopped, I didn't need the patch or I just decided to stop. I stopped. I've never had an issue with any addiction of any kind, food, alcohol, any poison in my life, really, except for my relationships, which obviously is where all of my issues played out. But, uh, so I, I, oh, what was I saying? I can't remember what I was saying. So anyway, I was, um, I realized before, when I turned the radio off that I heard the words, let it go. And I instantaneously knew that it was a message that it's time for me to let this go completely. Let it go means let it go. So I got that message. I was smiling like an idiot. And I said, thank you, Gina, like 15 times for the help. I appreciate it so much. But it took another week to two weeks. And I don't exactly remember how much time it was. But this is when I was giving the teaser unintentionally. I was still going through this to really let go of everything. And the most difficult thing was the first couple of times that I had to come home with my phone. The first time I'd gone to my daughter's, it was the first, the next Monday, I think. I went to the, my daughter's for the day. Uh, I had my phone in my truck and in my pocket and out and, and on, you know, I didn't go to the store or anything that day. And on the way home, this was a few days later after the, uh, no, I'm sorry, two days after the let it go message where I hadn't really left my house again and I didn't have a need to clean my phone. So now I'm coming back home after leaving my daughters and all I can think about is my phone. And I can hear my mind saying, are you sure you shouldn't just clean it? I know, let it go, but we should probably just clean the phone. It makes sense, right? And I'm battling this on my way home. And I finally got to a point where I said, that's enough. I said, Gina, do whatever you want. I said, if you get home and you clean your phone, that's what you do. If you cannot clean your phone, that would be great. But I'm not going to force you to do anything. You need to do this on your own accord. <laughs> so I was like talking like a, like a coach or something. I just like, do it at your own leisure. It doesn't have to be today. We know what we have to do. Just let it be. So I went home. And I, the first thing I do is wash my hands, which I will continue to do. And I'm washing my hands. And what I normally would do is I would not dry my hands. I would walk over to the sanitizing pack. I would pull out a wipe and I would clean my phone. And then I would go wash my hands again. That's what I would do every day when I got home. And my phone would sit there and dry. And that's how, that's what I did. So I walked into the house fully aware that I didn't know what I was going to do. And I just allowed myself the space to do whatever I did. And this is important. And it was for me, and it continues to be, is to allow myself to make the choice in the moment instead of needing to know ahead of time. And this has already been so useful to me in so many other things that I'm doing. Like, for example, my retirement account and all those things, which I may talk about down the road. But right now, this is, was so important for me to just allow myself the space that I needed to do what I wanted to do. So what was going to be more powerful, the phobia or my desire to be free? That was really what was at play here. So I washed my hands and instead of turning towards the sanitizing wipes, I turned towards the towel and I dried my hands and I said to myself, nice job. So I left my phone where it was, and I'm not going to tell you it was easy. It took a lot of effort for me to go grab that phone again, knowing it was dirty, quote unquote. I brought it into my house and I did everything I normally did. And I found myself avoiding the phone. And I said out loud, you can't avoid the phone. You have to do this. You have to go back to pre-COVID protocol. And it took me a full week into the second week to really 
not have to make an effort to do the things that I was doing that I thought were protecting me from illness, which by the way, did not protect me. I had COVID several times. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, I never was tested for it, but it's now endemic, meaning we all have it. I don't worry about it. I haven't thought about it in over a year. I've had it. It's not been a big deal. I literally have no symptoms, but I know that I've had it because I have what's called uh, COVID toes. If anybody has experienced this as an after effect where you get these little blisters on your toes and your toes are red, your feet turn purple, your arm, your hands turn purple. This happened to me way back in the beginning when COVID started, when I thought I was protected and it's happened at least once or twice since. So just let me say that has not protected me from anything. <laughs> when I got sick uh, a couple of months ago in October, I got sick because I was kissing my grandbaby and other people were kissing my grandbaby and somebody got sick in the group and I got sick. It just, you, you don't avoid anything. I wasn't avoiding anything. I knew this logically, but it still would not translate to my action. So it took a lot of effort for this next week and a half for me to just do things that I would normally do. And I literally had to relearn how to live in the world without this phobia. And because and, I'm talking, it's been a month and a week now that I'm finally talking about it. And I can say with confidence, it's been about a week since I've really not thought much about it. So that was a full month. And I'm not saying I don't think about it because it still catches, captures my awareness. I just don't respond anymore. And the, the more often I don't respond, the easier it is for me to not do things phobic in the world. For example, when I go out to eat now, I still avoid the door handle. I will continue to do that. If I have to touch it, I do. It's not like I won't go in a place. I'll stand at the doorway and wait for somebody to let me in. If I have to touch it, I do. No big deal. I touch the handles in the grocery store. I do all the things I did before COVID. I'm not saying I'm not aware of it because I still have an awareness of it. But when I go to eat now, I do what I used to do. And I just ask for lemon. And I clean my hands with the lemon. That's all I do. And I have to tell you, the feeling of liberation is amazing. I feel like I overcame a, a malady in my body. It's like, like healing from an illness or waking up from a coma, which really is kind of the best way to put it because you become so sensitized to something specific in your world that you become desensitized to, the, to, to what is around it. And that's what an overfocus is on anything material or anything in our human lives that captures our attention uh, too much and, and takes our attention off the bigger picture, the bigger uh, experience. And this is why phobia and addiction are so detrimental and destructive to our lives because it reduces us to whatever that thing is. And that's all we are. And that's as much as I know about addiction and phobia, because this has been my, really my only experience with it. And again, because I'm so acutely aware of who I am in this world now as this transducer is of course, these experiences I'm going to have because I'm my empathy allows a, a depthness, a feeling uh, to really be able to experience this and, and then allows me the uh, data to always refer to this. I feel like a data, I feel like an alien in, a, in an alien world collecting data to take back home. I'm so aware of myself as this transducer, as this experiential physicist, that of course these experiences are important because I'm made to have them. I'm designed for this. But now I'm also designed to overcome them because of my activated third eye, of my ability to see myself in the third person, to experience, to be able to witness my life being experienced as a bystander, as an observer. That's what the third eye is. I never could really understand what the fuck is a third eye. Excuse the F-bomb. I know sometimes they're fortuitous. I, I forgive, forgive me, although they, it really is satisfying. So forgive me for that. <laughs> but I, I didn't understand what the third eye was until one day I just realized, oh, it's perspective. The third eye, it, I shouldn't say I realized it. Of, of course, a line in a show that I watched on Gaia, the integration or initiation. Oh my God. One thing he said in that line was that the third eye is us witnessing our lives. And of course that just spread in my body as a knowing, which is now easy for me to describe. 
we are witnessing our own lives as a third person. That's what the third eye is. Just imagine a uh, your, your home planet where you're sitting behind a console with a video screen in front of you and you had put a microchip in a human and you were having experiences through that human and you can see through the microchip through the eyes of the person and that is your vantage point. That's the third eye. It is me as an alien sitting at home watching myself having this experience in this virtual reality matrix. That's what it is. Isn't that cool? Come on, that's so cool. <laughs> so I am not done with this completely. I don't know that I ever will be. I still think about it. I still think about my phone. It feels like, oh, let me talk really quickly about the first time I came home from a grocery store, which was a very interesting experience. I had to battle, and this was in the first month, the, during the first, you know, really experimental time, first couple of weeks, when I went to the grocery store, the first week, actually, I went to the first time I went to the grocery store in the first week of this, which was a day or two after I left my daughter's and didn't clean my phone when I got home. I knew this was going to be the real test because what I would do when I went in the grocery store is I would handle the cart, the doors on the coolers and all the groceries, and then my debit card and the store card. And so aware of everything I was touching it every time it felt like a physical film on my fingers, like a dirt on my fingers. I could not wait to clean my hands. And I walked to my car and I, there's my sanitizer bottle that I would normally squirt in my hands and clean the crap out of my hands before I drove away. <laughs> I had to resist doing that, which I did. Got home, put my phone on the dirty table, washed my hands, turned around, and I just knew I wasn't going to clean. I knew I couldn't, although the, it was very powerful, the desire to do so. So I guess my point here is I don't want to undervalue the effort it took to, even in this awakened state and understanding completely what was going on, most people in an addiction uh, event don't understand what's going on. So I completely feel for anyone in that situation, this was the most difficult thing I had to do was to will myself not to clean my phone or wash my hands several times during the first week or two of this experience. So I don't want to discount anything. It's been a month and one week. And I feel, I would say 98% free of this malady. And I'm going to call that a victory because I'm not shooting for perfection. I don't want my life controlled by anything that isn't my choice. Meaning I don't want anything in my body, in my life that isn't my choice to have it there. This was not my choice. This was a malady in my energy. This was a thorn or a demon. However you want to put it, this is the demons we have to exercise or the dragons we have to slay. And again, we don't slay our dragons, we domesticate them. And that's how I see this. This polarity of bad and good is necessary to be in balance. You don't overcome one and then discount the other. That's out of balance. We have to integrate our darkness and then it becomes useful to us. It is not bad. It is just part of who we are. It's part of who, what we experience in this 3D world polarity, and I'm learning more and more about this because it's coming up more and more, is the positive and the negative, and the negative we as humans perceive as bad. But negative just means opposite in this context. It's a magnetic opposite. That's polarity. It's not good or bad. It's just positive and negative. But we see negative as bad. So we experience it as bad. And that really is you get what you expect. It is so clear to me. So no, the darkness, I welcome. Whenever I get an opportunity like I had a month and a week ago where I had that energetic event, I am so excited to be able to have another experience and to be able to learn from it. This is what we're made for. This is what we're designed for. And me as an empathetic person and anyone who has deep empathy or an empath, you're here to feel it more than most. And that's not an accident. So by embracing that gift of our empathy, of our compassion, we are now hardwired for unconditional love because we can see beyond ourselves and our own pain and our own discord. Empathy is, is an emanation. It's something that affects all life. 
just like love, which is a, a powerful emanation, it raises the frequency of all life around us. So as an empathetic person, even in your lower frequencies, you're still emanating empathy. And, but it, it's almost like a, a lifeline to your ethereal self. If you have deep empathy, it's, it's like a bridge. It's already there. It's always there. Without empathy, like someone like my ex-husband, who is unfortunately void of, of empathy and compassion by design in his life, for his purpose, for his mission, he doesn't have that bridge. So overcoming that is much more difficult. And he may not be able to in this lifetime. I don't know. That's up to him in his life's design. But that empathy is a bridge for us. It's a, it's, it is a silk rope to our ethereal selves. It's always intact. So the fact that you're empathetic or an empath, and if you look at that as a, as a, as a bad thing, I just would encourage you to look at that more holistically and how it applies to your life as a human. And more importantly, to your ethereal purpose as a light being in the, in this human 3d realm, we are all here for a reason and nothing is accidental. So if there's more to report on this in the future, I will happily do that. But I am just liberated from this. Uh, I will always be aware of it. Acute awareness is just my thing. And, and, and you don't turn it on and off. It's, I'm aware of everything. It, the trick is not being afraid of what you see. It's not fearing it. Darkness illuminates or it contrasts the light. That's how light shines. So you, you have to realize the importance of our darkness. It's just a matter of going into it, making friends with it, domesticating it, integrating it, transcending it. That's, all, that's what we are meant to do. That's what we're here to do. And then to remember who we are. And then as in that remembering, we, we transcend, we become ethereal again. We are human ethereals. We are, our third eyes are completely activated. So, uh, thank you for listening again. I, as always, I appreciate you so much, especially if you stay the whole time, which I know these can go long. I always want to give them the space that they need. And I appreciate you if you attended the entire time. And if you didn't, thank you for the time you spent with me. And please remember to look for the magic all around you in serendipity and listen to your body, feel your body. Your body is speaking to you always, not just through your intuition, but through your feelings, through how you feel, through your energy. So until we meet again, thank you so much and have a wonderful day.